My name is Dr. Choi, I'm actually a clinic of uh, Dr. Ko. After a well fired up tachycardia, maybe we can tone down a little bit and talk about bradycardia. So I guess this topic is probably relevant if you have a patient who comes into your clinic, um, you know, presenting to you with an extremely slow pulse and you wonder whether this is actually normal or is it something that you should be aware of. So first of all, uh, I'd like to take about one minute to two minutes of uh, basic physiology to break it down to you. So what forms a heartbeat? Yes, love. I heard someone say love. Yes, love forms a heartbeat. But I would like to explain a bit more on the biological side rather than the emotional side. So the concept of time and speed of the conduction system, which is something that we have to be really aware of. So um, when you look at this diagram, it brings us back to those days when we were studying medicine in medical school, isn't it? Even up to now, I still go back to this diagram from time to time. Because it's actually the most important diagram in terms of the conduction, the speed of conduction in our heart. When you look at all these uh, action potentials, I think most of us will probably recognize this. This is the most common action potential. But we forget that we have also other types of action potential pertaining to different sites in the heart. When you look at all these uh, graphs, right, I want you to look at the P wave and the R wave. How does the P wave and the R wave stand out? compared to the other segments in the normal ECG. You notice that the P wave and the R wave are very rapid, very fast and very rapid kind of deflection compared to the T wave. Am I right? And the reason behind it is that when you look at the types of action potential, you look at the, uh, the phase zero. This is actually all sodium-gated sodium -gated channels. All these sodium-gated channels getting into the cells, depolarizing. Therefore, the P wave and the QRIs waves are always very fast compared to what we see over here. Look at your AV node. Okay. Look at your AV node. So the AV node has calcium channel uh, gated um, conduction rather than sodium. And that is why we have a PR prolongation. Imagine if you do not have a PR uh, segment in the ECG, your atrium and ventricle will contract at the same time, and that is quite disastrous. Today. So this is important to know this conduction system. So therefore, when we look at the uh, patient who has a bradycardia, the first question is: when you have a patient coming with a lower heart rate, it can either be physiological, perhaps if you are sleeping right now, then it is normal to be having sinus bradycardia, right? Or it can be pathological. Now the question is whether it is pathological bradycardia, we have to find out where the source of bradycardia is. It makes sense, right? If you have a patient coming with a heart rate of 30, something must be wrong. All the way from the sinus node up to the cardiac muscles. I'll give you an example. If the sinus node is the culprit, then we call that sick sinus syndrome. Sinus node dysfunction. Sometimes it can be it can be firing, sometimes it goes to long pauses. Alright? Or it can be actually over the AV node. You have uh, type 1, the first degree heart block, second degree heart block, or even complete heart block. Or maybe a little bit lower, you can have fascicular heart block, like right by the branch block and left by the branch block. Well, the concept is actually you have a patient with bradycardia, you have to find out. There has to be an explanation. It cannot be just miraculously bready. Block is. Now, coming back to the main story. So, I got two cases to share with you today. Uh, these are all real cases. Uh, first case is actually a 56 year old woman. She came to the clinic one day complaining of dizzy spells for the past three days. So it tells us that it's actually acute, nothing chronic. She has underlying aortic stenosis, she has had AF before, and then sinus. She also had history of heart failure. Well, medication wise, no beta blocker, no calcium channel blocker, just a bit of uh, blood thinner and static. Now, this is her ECG. Let's take a moment to have a look at this ECG. Topic, it has to be pretty. Isn't it? So this is a bradycardic ECG. How many of you think that it's sinus bradycardia? You know, one look, oh, this sinus bradycardia, nothing, no big deal, go home. But doctor, I got dizziness. Um, I'll take some stamina, you'll be fine. You know? yeah. So sometimes when you look at this ECG, you must try to remember what I say to you about the diagram, the sodium channels. When you have a T wave that looks like this, look at the T wave over here. It's like a like an M shape, right? And the second M seems to be very fast, very rapid. 
So T waves don't behave as such because T waves form for repolarization. Potassium channels, they come in very slow. You know, it's a balance between potassium and calcium, you know. It's a very slow and prolonged kind of a, a repolarization. It's going to be very smooth. But when you see a jiggle over the T wave, you have to ask yourself, is there some sodium channels going on there? And this patient actually has hidden P waves in between. Okay, so this is definitely not the sinus bradycardia. And if you count the P waves, you will probably um, realize that it's actually, sorry, it's actually a two to one heart block. Okay, keep it, right? It's a two to one AV block. So my next question is, which is commonly asked, is this Morbis type 1 or Morbis type 2? Anyone would like to say it's Morbis type 1? Do I see? Yep. No? Okay. So the, the point is, let's go back to Morbis type 1 and Morbis type 2 again. These are the two ECGs I got from the internet, not mine. So over here, I think everyone can see very clearly, there's a, you know, these are the P waves. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So the fifth P wave got non-conducted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So when you look at the PR interval, it gets longer and longer. And then there's a drop beat. So this is the classic Morbid's type 1. Right? Whereas the ECG on your right, almost similar looking. You have P wave, P wave, P wave, and then there's a drop beat over there. But when you look at this, the PR interval seems to be consistently similar. There's no prolongation of the PR. Therefore, we call this Morbid's type 2. But the question is, why are we so bothered about Mobius type 1 or Mobius type 2? It's because of this. When you have a Mobius type 1, it usually pinpoints towards the AV nodal area. It's very high up there. All right? And this is the behavior of the AV node. So for example, if I were to give you pain, enough pain, you know, some of the patients, they come in, you put a you know, granular or you give local over the leg, you know, a toe because you pull out the nail. I had once myself, I was a... I did a, a local medical clinic, you know, I was about to pull a nail out and I gave the pull, the patient went to the cut and fainted. It's a very classic example of over hyper vagotonia. When some, sometimes patients, when they see pain, right, the vagotone comes in so excessively after the sympathetic tone that they actually get AV block. Alright, but it's all moving, it's type 1. It's fine. The patient will be fine after that, they'll recover. It's not labeled Morbis type 1 or Morbis type 2. Because in order to say it's Morbis type 1 or 2, you need to have at least two conducted P waves. And when you have every other bit of the P wave getting blocked, you can't tell. It could be 1, it could be 2. You get back, it's still 50 and 50%. But sometimes it's okay to guess. If you were to guess, this is Morbis type 1, which is quite safe, or is this Morbis type 2, which is not so safe, which one would you guess? 1 or 2? Two, good. So uh, here too, I guess it's two as well. Why? Because you see, this patient has a baseline ECG of right bundle branch block. Sorry, I'm going to show you this ECG back again. A baseline ECG of right bundle branch block. It means that even without doing anything, the conduction in the right bundle is already sick. So if we were to close our eyes and guess, well, obviously the conduction system is actually not doing very well. So meaning that, most likely, this two to one AV block has got to do with Mobius type 2. So anyway, so moving on, um, I don't have much time actually. Side of block, so is this patient having suprahesian or infrahesian and any progression into complete heart block, the risk is high and fit. So we admitted the patient to CCO and it shows the heart rate of, you know, very low heart rate, everyone very worried. And then we managed to capture this ECG. Have a look at this ECG. What do you think? The same patient, See, so this is a very common uh, error. PVC by definition means premature. Alright, when you look at this B and this B, if we calculate the rate, so 300, 150, 175, 60, 50, 43, 38, it's 38 bits per minute. You can't have a premature B defined as a 38 bit per minute. So this is actually an escape bit. When the heart stops too long, what happens is they decided to keep you alive. So some of the cells will start to fire on the phone. And this is one of the, the bees that got fired up. So we call this an escape bee. It looks exactly the same as a PVC. The difference is, it came in to rescue you. PVC came in to kill you. It's different, all right? But the morphology of the escape bee tells you that, you know, this bee is coming very low at the bottom because it's so broad, it's so bizarre looking. 
So the conduction system is very poor indeed. And this patient might go into ventricular stenosis or even AC stone if we don't do anything. So obviously we have to put in a pacemaker and after putting a pacemaker, the patient became symptom free. So the key points will be always identify advanced or severe AV block in patients with unexplained dizziness and also underlying abnormal conduction pattern like in this patient with 2 to 1 AV block, right bundle branch block. Some of our aortic stenosis. You know the aortic valve, right, is actually just above our AV node. So if the valve can be very stenosed due to degeneration, obviously the level of degeneration can also invade and affect the AV node and affect the vascular branch as well. So 2 to 1 AV block always not enough. Try to do more ECGs to find out whether it's a Mobis type 1 or Mobis type 2. I see what he means, right? Okay. So just a quick one, we'll move on to the last case. Real case, very old man, 89 year old tourist. He has underlying hypertension or novas, you know, uh, sorry, um, and low 10 milligram. He was very well, fine. Until one morning, he was eating his breakfast. Suddenly, he just fainted. Witnessed by everyone his grandson, his daughter, and it was rushed immediately to the hospital. An ECG was done, and it was written as sinus rhythm, beating at 80 beats per minute. Narrow QRS complex. Now, different from the first case, which was actually broad complex because uh, it was right under branch block. That's why you suspect some kind of vascular problem, right? But it is narrow QRS and beating 80 beats per minute cannot be from the heart, right? So, therefore, and then there's no inferior MI, X ray, trop D, D dimer, everything normal with uh, fainting episodes can be either from the brain, example, seizures, uh, massive stroke, uh, we only respect to the neurologist, uh, heart rate. It can be grady or tacky. In a patient, 89 year old man, if you were to guess this is from the heart and he has to do with the brain, do you think it's more likely to be tacky or grady? Grady, yes, partially because I'm very grady as well. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, he went to ICU and you know, ICU they have this uh, cardiac monitoring thing. So, it's very six important six to sir. actually uh, deal with this. It's a very useful tool because we found fainting again in ICU. So this is real, I'll take a picture of it. So look at these are all sinus beats, the narrow complex, normal beats, right? And then suddenly, what do you see here? Exactly. We have a lot of P waves running through, but all these P waves don't get conducted. And when the P waves don't get conducted, obviously the heart will stop beating. And that's why they have a seizure. I mean, he had a seizure, but there was no blood going to the brain. So this is also the same kind of uh, segment that we can see is 13 seconds pause. For 13 seconds, the heart stopped beating. Although the patient was firing non-stop. The patient was actually working very hard. Six fire, 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 fire. But nothing was conducted. Because this patient had complete heart block. Complete AV block. And there was actually no escape rhythm at all. Until here, there's a tiny escape rhythm that came in a bit too late. Because he's 89 year old. Right? So you have to understand there's some, there's some kind of a degeneration going on in the conduction system. And you look at this, this is the pulse oximetry, right? So one bit of the pulse, one bit of the pulse, you can see the pulse stop beating. And that's what happened to him. That's why he starts seizing away. Alright? So what he had was actually a ventricular standstill. So we call it ventricular standstill because the atrium is still firing. It's not sinus pulse. Basically, it had no more phase after that. So just one good question. Um, what's one question? If you were to choose in an 89 year old man, okay, who has probably another 30 more years to go, all right? Will you choose a single chamber or a dual chamber? I always get asked this question. That baseline can be always a misnomer. This patient had a normal ECG when he came in, perfectly normal. But of course, at that time he was not fainting anymore. Always suspect conduction defect in the elderly with unexplained weakness syncope. Means that it's actually not a fake kind of uh, fainting episode, alright? And immediate CNS recovery is usually a very reliable sign. When they wake up, they'll tell you, what's going on, what's going on? You know, they can recognize you, there's no confusion, there's no face where they don't know where they are, this orientation. So when they wake up, immediately they know where they are, most of the time it's coming from the heart. And last thing will be, bradycardia with symptoms is almost always pathological. It's up to us to reveal it. So that's all on my side. Maybe we can have some uh, Q&A. Okay, thank you.